Welcome to this third episode in my series on the murder of Inga Lodge. So let's continue where we ended off at previous episode. First, I want to apologize for taking so long to get this video out and for the sound troubles we've had with the previous video. I hope that this one sounds a lot better. So after finding out about the daughter's murder, Mrs. Lotz was obviously extremely distressed and she ran back into the house screaming. Marius and Fred followed her inside to support her as best as they could. And one of the first things they helped her with was to call a very good friend, Ileana Prinsloo, to come and provide support. Then they had to break the news to Inga's father, who was in Bloemfontein at the time. But Mrs. Lotz first wanted to call a professor in Bloemfontein, a colleague of her husband, to break the news to Professor Lotz. Obviously, Mrs. Lotz didn't want her husband to be alone when he received the devastating news. Unfortunately, she couldn't find the phone number, and with Marius and Fred's help, he finally called his cell phone. Obviously, Mrs. Lotz was so distraught that she couldn't complete the call, and Fred had to take over to continue the conversation with Professor Lotz. One of the family members that got notified sooner after was Adri Mayberg. Uh, he was Inga's uncle and Mrs. Lotz's brother. And he was in Kuruman at the time. He in turn notified his twin brother, Ian Mayberg, who was in Pretoria at the time. And Ian got this call at about 10 to midnight. And 15 minutes later, at about 5 past midnight, he called Professor Lotz. He called him again at about 25 past midnight. And he indicated that he wanted to drive through to Bloemfontein to meet up with Professor Lotz there so together they could fly to Cape Town. But Professor Lotz told him rather to go to Cape Town directly and that they would meet up there. So Ian Mayberg then made his way to the airport where he arrived at about 2 a.m. But unfortunately, there were no flights that time of the morning and the first flight out was at 6 a.m. Apparently he slept in the airport lobby as there were no rooms available in the airport hotel. So here we have Fred's cell phone records from between when Mrs. Lotz called him in his vehicle, remember the call he refused to answer, and about 12.41 when activity on his cell phone stopped, only to resume a few hours later at five past five. Uh, MTC means incoming call, MOC means outgoing call, incoming text message, outgoing text message, and call forwarding. Call forwarding means that the recipient's phone was either switched off or busy at the time. Now, for some reason, Vodacom and MTN are just not able to record the phone numbers associated with incoming SMS messages, hence the question marks. There were quite a number of calls between Fred and his family in the Eastern Cape. In all cases, except for one, they were all incoming calls, meaning that they called Fred. So these are the calls associated with the people from the His People Church. And you can see that very early on, he got a phone call from Pastor Philip Pretorius, who is the brother of Christo Pretorius, the one that uh, discovered Inga's body. Although I can't say it with certainty, it's very likely that Pastor Philip conveyed the news that he learned from the police that Inga did not commit suicide and that she was murdered. And it's also quite possible that he mentioned to Fred that Inga was stabbed with a knife. Now, Fred also called Sylvia Strauss. She was Inga's Bible study counselor. According to Fred, he called Sylvia to find out whether Inga's relationship with the Lord was in good standing and that she would therefore go to heaven. Then at 11.34, Fred called the phone of Shahana Tofi, his supervisor at Old Mutual, and there was a 58 second conversation. Now, according to Fred, he called her to inform her that his girlfriend has been murdered and that he won't be able to attend the work session next day. Now, I find this very unusual. Like how many of us would call your supervisor at 11.30 at night when they, were, when they were very likely in bed sleeping already 
let them know that you won't be at work the next day. It's not like Shahana Tofi was in a close relationship with Inga, or even great friends with Fred. I find this unusual. I think it would have been better for Fred to wait till the next morning, or to send Shahana an email or an SMS message. And then half an hour later, Shahana Tofi called and had another 78 second conversation. Now the purpose and the content of the second call has never been revealed. And from his cell phone, Fred made only one call to a doctor to come and provide assistance to Mrs. Lodge. Uh, this call was forwarded to voicemail. It is however possible that Fred made some calls from the Lodge home phone. Now Fred's phone records show that there was no activity between 12.41 and 5.05. .05. And when activity resumed, at 5.05, .05, Fred's SIM card was placed in a different phone. It seems that because his usual cell phone was running low on power, Fred borrowed the cell phone of one of Inga's friends, Sunel. So we know therefore that Fred did not have his cell phone with him when he went to the Bishop Labour's police station a little bit later to be interviewed. We know that within about 30 to 40 minutes after his return to the Lord's home, that the SIM card was transferred back into his usual phone. Another question is what happened in this period here? Although it's not impossible, it would be highly unusual under the circumstances that Fred's phone did not receive any calls or SMS messages during this period of time. So what happened with the phone? Did he switch it off to sleep or did it run out of power? If he switched his phone off, did he not notice that the power was low? And if he did run out of power, why didn't he change it right there and then? Why didn't he charge it right there and then? And if he did, I'm sure that by 5 or 5, the phone would have been sufficiently charged that it would not have been necessary to inconvenience someone else by borrowing a phone. My question is, did Fred have any advance warning that the police was planning to interview him? And what time did he find this out? Did he borrow a phone? because he did not want to take his usual phone with him to the police station. So this is Marius's phone record, only for the first hour after he broke the news until midnight. Uh, the question marks are because we have not been able to link all the phone numbers with the people that they belong to. So Marius made at least seven attempts from his cell phone to find the doctor. It seemed at that time of the night, it wasn't an easy task to find a doctor, but it, but eventually a doctor was found and a doctor did come to the home to give Mrs. Lotz a sedative. You can also see that Marius made a phone call to a local minister from the Dutch Reformed Church, and he did arrive there later that morning. So these are calls associated with people from the His People Church. You can see there are three calls alone from Philip Pretorius, who at the time was likely at the crime scene. He also received several calls from Fred's parents. So the first of Inga's friends that Marius informed was Wimpy Bosov, and Wimpy and his mother arrived at the Lord's home later that morning as well. And then after midnight, Marius also made calls to other friends like Jean Minar, Danny Griffinberg, and Bram Kreur. Now we know that Fred's phone activity stopped at about 042. And then Marius's phone received these phone calls from Fred's mother shortly thereafter. So in my opinion, these calls were actually meant for Fred. And that Fred's mother called Fred on Marius's phone because at the time Fred's phone was dead and probably charging. So if that was indeed the case, at 5.05, 
Brett's phone should have had sufficient charge for him to take his own phone to the police station. But during one of the calls with Pastor Philip, Marius asked him if he and Pastor Niels would come to the Lord's home to provide support to him and Fred. That was probably in response to some friction that developed between Marius and Fred. So throughout that morning, Marius tried to provide support to both Mrs. Lotz and Fred. And this led to friction between them. As Fred wanted Marius to pay attention only to Mrs. Lotz, as he was afraid that Mrs. Lotz may commit suicide. And when Marius indicated that Ileana Prinsloo was there to provide support to Mrs. Lotz, Fred just loudly shouted and screamed at Marius to leave him alone and to go look after Mrs. Lotz instead. Uh, Marius was also afraid that Fred may decide to drive to Inga's flat, so he asked Fred for his keys to his vehicle. But Fred refused and assured that he was not planning to drive there. So after the arrival of Pastors Philip and Niels, Fred eventually did give his keys to Marius. And knowing that Fred's vehicle was still dangerously parked in the side street, Marius drove the vehicle and pulled it up into the driveway in, in a safer position. But this led to another big argument as Fred was angry that Marius drove his vehicle without permission. And then Marius just gave up and returned the keys back to Fred. However, later that day, Fred asked Marius if they could swap vehicles for a while. Fred's parents arrived later that day and they would need a more spacious vehicle to get around. Fred had a, a bucky, a pickup truck, and Marius a Ford Fiesta. Marius agreed with this uh, arrangement and when asked later, Marius said that the only thing he found in the bucky was Inga's ID book, her identification document. Marius also volunteered to temporarily move out of the flat and to stay at the friend's place so that Fred's parents could have full use of the, of the flat in the Anvil Village complex. You will see later why this was a mistake. So, Throughout that morning, many people came to the Lord's home. As mentioned before, Pastor Philip and Pastor Niels arrived. Amongst others, Wimpy Bosov and his mother arrived, and other friends of Inga. These friends were later asked about Fred and Marius' demeanor and behavior that morning or that evening. And one noticed that Marius and Fred did not look emotional at all and kept to themselves while other people were in the kitchen crying and mourning. Another person remarked that Fred did not look sad at all, and not even angry. He was just meek and submissive. Mrs. Lotz recalled that Fred kept repeating that everything will be okay, that he will become the child in the house. He also said this in the presence of Professor Lotz, Ileana Prinsloo, and Minister Dani van Sale. And remember, this is something that Fred always denied. Sometime that night, Fred spoke to Mrs. Lotz and Ileana and told them about the breakfast which Inga made the previous morning and how Inga had toast and how everything was so nice between them. Then Mrs. Lotz asked Fred if it was a letter which uh, Inga gave him after his classes that morning. And Fred said, yes, it was just a small little letter and that he will show Mrs. Lotz later. And that they did. He did show uh, the small letter to Mrs. Lotz later. My question as to when this happened is very unclear and frustratingly so. Uh, as you will see uh, shortly, Marius went back to the flat at about 5 a.m. and brought back with him an envelope, uh, the same envelope which Inga supposedly gave Fred. And now the question is, did Fred show this the short letter to Mrs. Lotz before he got the envelope or after? And soon you'll see why this is an important question. So this is the note or a short letter that Fred showed Mrs. Lotz. So after reading this letter, uh, Mrs. Lotz found it strange that Inga would send such a letter that wishes Fred well for the week, midway through the week on a Wednesday. 
Although she wasn't certain, she thought that she had seen that very letter or one very similar to it in the house before. Apparently, Inge was in the habit of leaving such notes for Fred on a Sunday afternoon to wish him well for the week ahead. According to Fred, this short letter was with the long letter in the envelope that Inge gave him that morning. And if, therefore, if this short letter was shown to Mrs. Lodge before Marius brought the envelope back from the flat at Antwerp Village, then obviously this is a lie. Unfortunately, the timing of when Fred showed the letter is unclear and this is inconclusive. Now, Fred later claimed that he purposefully didn't want to show the long letter to Mrs. Lodge because of the reference therein to Professor Lodge and his supposed drinking, and he was afraid that it would be very upsetting to the Lodges. In the long letter, it is said, Further, I'm extremely scared of the Easter weekend and that you will see my father when he has too much to drink. I don't want to lose you in such a way and I don't want, to, don't want you to see that side of my family. Now, to be very clear, Professor Lodge was not an alcoholic, nor did he abuse alcohol. Red wine was simply part of the culture that the Lodges lived in and associated with like many Kryptonians. Often father and daughter shared a glass of red wine in its other, in other's company. Professor Lodge tried to teach Inga the difference between the wines, a Merlot versus a Shiraz, but to Inga they all tasted the same. Fred have also spent many weekends uh, in Valgemoet when the father was there. He also spent a, a Christmas uh, break with them at the holiday home in, in Witsand, and never has Fred seen Professor Lotz drinking too much. The fact is that this sentence reflects worse on Fred than on Professor Lotz, even if the allegations about the drinking was true. So what was Fred really concerned about? Was it perhaps rather concerned that Mrs. Lotz would find out that there was an argument between them that morning? Or the fact that Inge was afraid that he may dump her over something her father might do over which he had no control and how this would reflect on him and the dynamics in their relationship. He didn't want people to start asking questions about what would compel Inge to say something like that that had no basis in truth whatsoever. I will look at this letter in a substantial amount of detail in another episode. As mentioned, sometime before 5 a.m., Marius told Fred that he wanted to go back to the flat to change clothes and to leave a message for his manager at Old Mitchell. Fred asked Marius to bring back with him a black folder that was on his desk and to make sure that he also brings an envelope with a letter in it with him. Marius then left and arrived at the apartment at about 5 a.m. He showered, had some tea, grabbed the folder and envelope, and then went to Old Mitchell to leave a message for his manager. So security records show that Marius entered Old Mitchell at 5.36 and then left again at 5.47. Marius arrived back at the lodge home just after 6 o'clock, and when he called Fred at 6.08, Fred told him that he was on his way to be questioned by the police. So in the evening of the 16th, uh, Superintendent Neville de Beer from the Serious Violent Crime Unit stationed in Bishop Levis was the standby duty officer. And he was called out by radio control to attend to the crime scene at the Shiraz complex. His duty was there to assess the crime scene and to determine whether uh, the investigation should be handled by the Serious Violent Crime Unit or by the local detectives. And he came to the conclusion that the investigation should be taken care of by the Serious Violent Crime Unit. At the scene, he found out that Inge had a boyfriend and he thought that it was important to have an exploratory interview with Fred as quickly as possible. 
not because Fred was uh, a suspect at the time, but because he was the person in the best position to provide information about Inga, her family, her friends, her enemies, her plans for the day, her activities and her movements. But this is good policing and in no way should it be construed as the police developing tunnel vision and only, and only focusing on Fred. In fact, in the next episode, I will make the argument that the police did not focus on Fred enough and they should have focused more on him in those days and weeks after the murder. Now, Superintendent De Beer didn't want to interview Fred at the lot's home, understandably so. So he asked an Inspector Peterson to accompany Fred to fetch him from the lot's home and to accompany him to his office at Bishop Labour's police station. So Inspector Peterson and three other officers left. And when they arrived at the lot's home sometime before six o'clock, one of them rang the doorbell, Fred came out, and he agreed to follow them to the Bishop Labour's police station in his own vehicle. And one of the officers drove with him. However, before leaving, Fred told some of the officers that earlier he was very worried about Inga because she didn't answer her phone. And he then started driving towards Stellenbosch and turned around and turned around just before the speed camera on the Kulenhof Road after getting a call from Marius Burta asking him to turn around. Now at that time, the only speed camera on the Kulenhof Road was at Kayamandi. And here you can see the position of Kayamandi relative to the lot's home. And it's a distance of about 32 kilometers. Later, probably after giving it some thought and realizing the utter absurdity of this version, Fred changed his vision that he turned around at the intersection of Commissaris and Jep de Jager. And as we indicated in our previous episode, that wasn't well thought out either. So after Fred arrived at the Bishop Levis police station, he was taken to the office of Superintendent de Beer. And there were three other officers present. And Fred was observed to be very calm. They explained to him that the purpose of the interview was for them to get to know Inga better and that Fred could help them by providing information about Inga, the movements of friends and her family. So Fred started off by giving general information about Inga, her parents, himself, his parents, his work at Old Mutual, Marius Butter, and he even included information about Marius Butter's car, that it was a, a blue Ford Fiesta. He mentioned that he's known Inga for four years and that they've been together going out with each other since November 2004. He identified a lot of Inga's friends, uh, Rimpi Bosov, Sylvia Strauss, Saret Skitter, the beauty queen friend of Inga and Marius, in the magazine that she was reading at the time of the attack, Tian, Retha, and Sunel. He even mentioned where Rimpi lived, where he studied, what type of car he drove, and what his commuting habits to the university were, and Later on, he even mentioned the exact clothes that Wimpy wore that Wednesday evening at the lodge home. Knee-high khaki pants and a checkered shirt. Now, I'm no expert in analyzing verbal and written statements and how to detect deception. And I've done some reading about it, and it seems to me that the inclusion of excessive irrelevant details is done to increase the, believ the believability of a version. I simply cannot think of no other reason for him to talk about Bumpy's clothing. So when asked about his working hours, Fred said that he worked from seven to five and sometimes to six o'clock. He told the beer about his sleepover arrangements at Inga's place on Tuesdays, so he, he could attend classes at the university between eight and 11 every Wednesday morning. He mentioned that the previous morning Inga was waiting for him outside his class at about 10 a.m. and that she walked with him to his vehicle. He made no mention of the envelope Inga gave him and he left the impression that the meeting wasn't prearranged. And then Fred talked about the kitchen cupboard and he, that he went to pick up 
at Merriman Furnitures uh, before going through to Old Mitchell, where we arrived at about 10 past 11. Uh, Fred then mentioned that Shahana Tofi was his immediate supervisor and that she could be reached through a central exchange. But the question is, why didn't he just give the police the phone number? Why should the police have to go through a central exchange? Well, it could be that he did not have Shana's cell phone number with him because he had a borrowed phone. His usual phone was at, was at the lot's home, supposedly charging. Or he simply did not want to, he didn't want the police to call Shahana right there and then. Because it seems that while Brett was an interview, lots of interesting things were happening behind the scenes, which culminated in this email. So at 7.44, Jakob Ghosh emailed Shahana Tofi and said, Brett's girl unfortunately got murdered last night in Stellenbosch. Marius Bota, his flatmate, asked if you could please give him a ring when you get into the office. The police just wants to confirm Fred's whereabouts during yesterday afternoon. Kind regards, Yaku. And then three minutes later, Yaku Ghos also emailed the vet from the Spey. Would you please give Marius a call when you get to the office? Now, if you remember correctly, uh, the vet from the Spey had a desk right next to Fred. And he would have been able to testify or tell the police that Fred was in the office from between 5.30 and 6 o'clock that afternoon. Now let's explore the chain of events that led up to these two emails. Now we know that Fred arrived at Bishop Labour's police station at about 20 past 6. And then at 6.35, Marius called Fred and they were busy for 18 seconds. And then at 3 past 7, Fred got the phone call from his father and they talked for 82 seconds. So it's interesting to note that during the interview, the police was letting Fred accept phone calls from outsiders. And then at 7.17, Marius got a call from Fred's mother and they spoke for 96 seconds. Now, I think that the 18 seconds would not have been long enough for Fred to instruct Marius to get hold of Shahana Tofi and the vet from the Spey and to give Marius instructions on what to tell them when they call him. I think that conversation he had with his father during this phone call. And then the father asked Fred's mother to give Marius a call. And it was during this phone call that Fred's mother asked Marius to get in touch with Shahana Tofi and the vet from the Spey and then gave Marius instructions as, as to what to do should they call him back. And then at 7.33 and 7.35, Marius got a call from, or Marius called this number. We have not been able to definitively link it to Yaku House, but this is the only number that uh, we do not, that we're not able to link to a specific person. So it must have been Yaku House and they spoke for 56 and 96 seconds. Soon after, Marius called Fred again, 13 seconds, probably to tell Fred that he asked Yaku Ghosh to get in touch with Shana and the vet. At 7.43, Fred got a call from his father, 23 seconds. And then at 7.44, Yaku Ghosh emailed Shahana Tofi. And then the second email was sent three minutes later to the vet from the Spey. At 8.39, Marius got a call from an old mutual head office number. And again, at 12.46, Marius got a call from another old mutual head office number. So by this time, both Marius and Fred were already back at the lot's home. So back to the interview. Then Fred mentioned that old mutual had a computerized access control system that monitors the in and out movement of staff. He said that he was at work from about 10 past 11 to 5.30 to 6 o'clock that day. He explained that after work, he went to his flat at the past dinner, then dropped off the cupboard and returned to his flat at about 8 p.m. He then started to contact Inge. She did not respond, so he got worried. He also contacted Inge's mother. Uh, he said he was worried because Inge has fainted before because of low blood sugar. 
Then the beer asked about security at the Shiraz complex. And Fred said that one needs a remote to get into the complex. And he called and he said that he called Mrs. Lotz to get a remote from her. And then after picking up the remote from her, he started driving to Stellenbosch until Marius told him to turn around. Now this is in direct contrast with what Mrs. Lott said. According to Mrs. Lott, she was the one that reminded Fred to come pick up the remote, otherwise he won't be able to get into the complex. So when talking about the sleepover on Tuesday, the beer asked if they had sex, either the Tuesday evening or the Wednesday morning, and Fred said no, that they've never had sex before, that he slept on the sofa and Inga slept on her bed. Then he started to cry and ask if Inga was raped and the beer said it was too early to tell. Now on the beer's opinion, the crying seemed fake and insincere. The one moment Fred was calm and clinical and the next moment he was crying unconvincingly. Fred then told the beer that Inga and Vimpy had lunch together and that he got a text message from Inga afterwards that she had a good lunch. He also said that the tiler came that afternoon to repair some tiles and that, they, and that the tilers were supposed to be there on the Monday or the Tuesday. Fred then showed the beer the text message he got from Inga where she told him that the tiles had been repaired. The beer then asked about Inga's remotes, security remotes. Fred said that she had three security remotes, one for herself, one for her mother, and he didn't know the whereabouts of the third remote. He said that Inga had two bunches of keys and that the remote was on the bunch of keys that had the flat keys and that the car keys were separate. When asked about Inga's faith, Fred said that Inga was a Christian and involved in his people church. He made no mention of the Dutch Reformed Church, although Inga was still a very active member of the Dutch Reformed Church. When asked about Inga's previous relationships, Fred mentioned Ram Krier, who also worked at Old Mitchell, and that in 2004 Inga was still friends with a guy by the name of Nicol. When asked how he found out about Inga's murder, Fred said that while he was driving to Stellenbosch, Marius told him to turn around and to wait at the lot's home and that he didn't have good news. And when Marius arrived there, Marius told them that Inga has been murdered in her flat. Fred said that he heard Inga was stabbed and when asked where he heard this, Fred just said that news travels. Now, as mentioned before, there were enough contact between people that were at the crime scene and Fred, like Pastor Phillips, for example, for Fred to have found out legitimately that Inga has been stabbed. What is, however, curious is why he didn't simply say that he found out from Pastor Philip or Marius. Why the vagueness? The one moment he's telling police the precise clothing that Vimpy was wearing, and then the next moment he can't mention the name of the person or persons which told him that Inga was stabbed. Why is this? The beer then did a physical inspection of Fred's hands to look for cuts and bruises. And then Fred mentioned that Inga's father was a radiologist in Bloemfontein and that he and Inga did not get along at all. So far, it is abundantly clear that when it comes to Fred, we don't know where the lies end and the truth begins. So pay this statement no attention. It is simply not true, as anyone that knows the Lodges can tell you. What was the purpose of this lie? The beer asked if he knew of any previous sexual relationships Inga might have had, and Fred said that he was under the impression that Inga never had sex before. And when asked about the DVD in the flat, 
Fred says yes that Inge had a rental contract and that she was alone a lot and watched a lot of DVDs. The interview ended at about 20 past 8 and he was back at the lodge home at about 9 o'clock. At 7 past 9 he made a call to what appears to be an old mutual number and he spoke for three and a half minutes. I'm not sure who he spoke to. It wasn't the office or the cell phone numbers of Shana Tofi or the vet from the Spay. But in the meantime, while Fred was being interviewed by the police, Ian Mayberg's flight landed and he arrived at the lodge home at about quarter to nine, probably about 15 to 20 minutes before Fred's arrival back from Bishop Labors. When they met later that morning, Fred's first words to Mr. Myberg was, the police say that I've murdered Inge. And according to Ian Mayberg, Fred seemed nervous and avoided eye contact. Then uh, sometime later, Mr. Mayberg went to pick Professor Lodge up at the airport, whose flight landed at about 10.30 a.m. And when they got back to the Lodge home, Fred's parents who flew in from the Eastern Cape were already there. Mr. Mayberg got permission from Inga's father to start making funeral arrangements. And the funeral was to take place on Tuesday, March the 22nd. And Fred was asked by the family to prepare the funeral pamphlet. And as you can see, here is the pamphlet. The first morning, Fred moved into the guest bedroom where he usually slept when he visited uh, Inge. And when Ian Mayberg arrived, he moved into guest bedroom and Fred moved into Inga's room. In Inga's room, Fred made a bed on the floor and was seen burning candles for Inga at night while working on his laptop, surrounded by open books, Bible, I assume song books, uh, to, prepare for, to prepare Inga's funeral pamphlet. One morning at 4 a.m., Ian Mayberg noticed that the light in Inga's room was still on. Now Fred claimed that he wasn't the only one that burned candles in the house and that there were other people that also burned candles in other rooms. Uh, Mrs. Lotz denies this. She even spoke to the people that were in the house that evening and none of them knew of any candles burning in the house. So on the day of the autopsy, uh, March 18th, Professor Lotz asked his brother-in-law, Ian Mayberg, to identify Inga's body on the family's behalf. So whilst on the route to Stellenbosch, Mayberg received a call from Fred requesting him to turn around because Fred has already made arrangements for two pastors of the His People Church to do the identification. Mayberg, however, just told Fred that he can't tell him what to do and he proceeded to the, mor to the morgue regardless. When he got there, he got into a verbal confrontation with the two pastors and they left. And when Professor Lotz found out about this later, he was very upset about this, not, not only because of what Fred did, but also because of the involvement of the His People Church. Now it seems while all of this was going on in Stalinbos, that Fred went to Old Mutual to briefly meet with Shahana Tofi. So at 9.14 and 9.19, Fred called Shahana Tofi. He was very likely in his flat at this time. And then very shortly thereafter, Shahana called back. And after this call, I think then Fred made his way to Old Mutual. And when he got there, he tried to call Shahana Tofi's number, but uh, it seems like Shahana Tofi was very likely busy on the phone at this time. And then he tried again at 9.24. And within five seconds after the end of this call, Fred entered uh, at the East Peak entrance, which is situated about here. And then less than five minutes later, he left through the East, the east entrance, which is about here. This is a side entrance. The main entrance is in the front here. 
Well, to me, it seems that Fred arranged to meet with Shahana downstairs in the lobby area of Old Mitchell to either drop something off or to pick something up. There simply wasn't enough time for a social visit. My question is, why didn't he just go up to Shahana's office and did his business there? Was he trying to keep his meeting with Shahana a secret that he didn't want his colleagues to see their meeting? What exactly was the purpose of this meeting? Or perhaps it was a completely innocent meeting, but these are still important questions to ask, at least to put our minds at ease that this wasn't a case of witness tampering or manipulation, especially considering that Johanna was probably Fred's most important alibi witness. So on Saturday, March the 19th, Mrs. Lotz requested to see Inga's body to say goodbye. And because of the damage to, to Inga's body, it was agreed to keep the body covered and that Mrs. Lotz would only have access to Inga's left hand. And this was the only hand that didn't have any damage. So when Mrs. Lotz and her brother Ian Mayberg wanted to depart to the, to the undertakers, Fred and his mother also got into the car and indicated that they wanted to come along. Ian Mayberg told them that they couldn't come along and basically chased them out of the vehicle. And when Ian Mayberg and Mrs. Lotz arrived at the, at the funeral undertakers, guess who, who were already in the parking lot waiting for them? Fred and his mother. So after, so after Ian Mayberg told them that only Mrs. Lotz can see Inga, Fred went to speak to Mrs. Lotz, who then agreed that he could also come in with her to see Inga. Now, in a sworn statement, Ian Mayberg made a lot of observations about Fred's behavior in the Lotz home that week. It is no secret that Ian Mayberg disliked Fred intensely and that he was suspicious of Fred right from the beginning. And as there is no way to independently verify the veracity of Ian Mayberg's observations, I'm hesitant to go into it in too much detail. But just in broad terms, he got the impression that Fred was being controlling and manipulative. For example, he didn't want the lodges to read the newspapers. He answered incoming phone calls on the home phone and on the cell phones. And he was faking emotions to draw attention to himself. Fred also apparently included the photo of him in the funeral letter uh, after he got strict instructions to use only photos of Inga and his parents. And he had to remove this photo. Now, I don't want to give you the impression that Fred was an unwelcome guest in the house that week. The Lotzes did appreciate his love and support. And the night before the funeral, Mrs. Lotz sent uh, the following text message to Fred. Thank you for all your love, Fred. Our hearts have been broken by our angel child. Love you. Sleep well. And if Ian didn't put a stop to it, Inga's parents were just about to give Inga's car to Fred. And later, Fred was also asked to help Mrs. Lotz choose a dress in which Inga should be cremated. The funeral took place on Tuesday, the 22nd, in the Welcome Dutch Reformed Church. Both Wimpy Borsov and Fred van der Feyfer both delivered eulogies. Now, Wimpy's eulogy is too long to put in this video. But you can read the, tra the transcript and see the video on our website, truthfulinga.com. But I'm going to show you Fred's uh, video of, of his eulogy with subtitles. To see you all in grace uh, and heaven in a hall of flower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand. An eternity in an hour. Can you meet that much from the days? Special gedicht for the days. Brought the gnomes to the altar. 
ingen jeg har. Jeg vet ikke hva det er stikker. Jeg vet ikke hva det er stikker. Ons liefste meisieke nu. Ons vertrouw dat ons jemelse vader jou kinder sal tevoud en sy grote genade. En dat jy alles wat jy mag doen of besluit, getrouw sal bly aan jou geloof en jou God. Jy is een dierbare fijn meisie, met sterk waarmis, hoe een norm met een kreemwaar en tegelijk. Weet soos alles, dat ek gedierig vir jou bid en opdraag aan hom wat jou bid sma is. En jy moet aan jou die dag met die genade van ons Heere Jesus Christus die hele vir jou groot gemaakt as die kind van God en wist wie sy vir my was. Ek wil net een woord sê vir jou nie vir my was. Sy was Jesus. En ons al een ding is wat sy vir my gedoen het, was het om vir my Jesus te wees, en om my nader te breng. Sy het gedoen met sy nersteen. Dat is genoeg. Now Fred also did some other weird things at the funeral. Apparently, when two reporters came over to him to sympathize with him, he told them that he that he's not going to talk to the press without legal representation. And he also, in an irritated tone, told several people to rather sympathize with Bumpy, as Bumpy was closer to Inga than him. So sometime after the funeral, on the same day actually, Fred started moving clothes into the closet of the guest bedroom. Because later that evening, Ian Mayberg found a whole bunch of clothes in the cupboard of the guest bedroom that wasn't there before. It looked like Fred was serious when he said that he would move into the back room and become a child in the house. So Ian Mayberg took all the clothes, dumped it on the bed, and then Mrs. Lodge called Fred's father to come pick up the clothes. And that's how Fred finally left the house, never to set foot in it again. Now, on Friday, March the 18th, Inga's father retained the services of a private investigations firm, Yards, Fivers and Associates, to assist in the investigation of Inga's murder. On the same day, these investigators went through Inga's car and they found an, an old shopping list and an empty eyeglass holder. Now, take note of this little forgotten list. It became a weapon in a well-orchestrated campaign to further sully Inga's good name and to cause her parents more grief. Now, their first interview with Fred was on March the 19th already. And much what he told investigators is what he also told Neville de Beer. But there are a couple of interesting points to take note of. He said that from the beginning of 2005, it was common knowledge that the relationship between him and Inge was serious. And he noticed that Marius's attitude to him and Inge changed. Now, one of the things that aggrieved Marius at the time is that Fred and Inge kept the relationship a secret from him. And perhaps that's the reason why there was a change in attitude. He said that on the morning of the 16th that Inga was unhappy about the conversation he had with his brother the previous evening and that she cried because she couldn't support him enough. And then he said that after class she met with him and she handed him two letters in the same envelope. Again, he said that he realized that he did not have the remote for the gate and that he called Mrs. Lodge in order to pick up the remote. Again, this is not what Mrs. Lodge said. According to Mrs. Lodge, she was the one who brought up the idea that Fred should come and pick up the remote from her. Otherwise, he wouldn't be able to get into the complex. Fred said that he suspected that Tyler or somebody that worked in the premises that murdered Inge. 
Now, regarding the relationship with Marius, he said that he and Marius were like the biblical David and Jonathan before he and Inga started going out. And then the tension increased, especially from the beginning of 2005. Now, remember, this is also the time that, that Fred and Marius started sharing the flat in Antwerp Village. And that Wimpy told Inga that friction developed between Fred and Marius because Fred didn't like some of Marius' habits. For example, not washing the dishes. Fred then said that it got so bad that Marius even organized a housewarming party without inviting Fred and Inga. Now, according to Marius Boerter, this is a lie. About two weeks before the party, Marius emailed invitations to all his friends. And because Fred and Inga were a couple, he sent the email inviting the couple to Fred only. But it seems like Fred did not tell Inga about the party nor the invitation. According to Marius, Fred told him that, he, that they will not be able to attend the party as he has to study for a test the next week. When Inga later found out about the party that she wasn't invited, she was extremely upset. She even contacted some of her friends that attended and asked if they had a problem with her. Sadly, Inga died without ever knowing that she was indeed invited to the party. So two days before Inga's funeral, one of the private investigators told Inga's father that he is convinced that Fred is the murderer. When asked why he thought that, he said that Fred repeat, repeatedly told him, I have forgiven her for what she said to me. Again, I have forgiven her for what she said to me. And when Inga's father asked what Inga had said, the investigator said he doesn't know as Fred didn't want to tell him. Now this information was never included in the report that the investigators produced and which was handed to the police. Inga's father is upset about this as he feels this was crucial information that was withheld from the court. So here we have a situation where Fred was giving false and misleading information about Marius Porter, but the betrayal didn't stop there. So here we have a normal guy minding his own business, studying for an exam, taking care of his future when Fred entered his room expressing his concerns about Inga. Now, like a good friend, Marius offered to call Christopher Turius, who lived only minutes away from Inga. Certainly a more practical solution than Fred's desire to drive 20 minutes to the lot's home to pick up a remote and another 20 minutes to Inga's flat, while Inga could be up, lying on the floor bleeding out after bumping her head, after fainting. And then 10 minutes later, Marius got the terrible news and a terrible duty fell on his shoulders. It became his responsibility to tell her mother that her daughter was murdered or committed suicide. That must have been a very difficult thing to do. And many people would have chickened out or got somebody else to break the news or would simply have done it by phone in order not to be there to deal with the aftermath. But Marius did the right thing. He got in his car, he went to the lodge home, he broke the news in person, and then he stayed behind to provide support. I mentioned before that Marius agreed to swap vehicles with Fred for a week, so that it would be more comfortable for him and his parents to get around. Another kind thing that Marius did was to temporarily move out of the flat so that, these, so that Fred's parents could have use of the flat while they were supporting their son. But it seems that in his absence, someone snooped through Marius's personal belongings in his bedroom, including his diaries. And in one of the diaries, the snooper found an entry where Marius asks for God's forgiveness over a curse he has spoken over Fred and Inge. Now, without Marius's knowledge, the diary was removed and the relevant pages were photocopied and the diary was returned to its normal location for, so that Marius would not know what happened. Then, 
Louis van der Faithful contacted one of the private investigators and told him what was found in Maurice's diary. Then on March 28, this private investigator contacted Inspector de Villiers and requested him to obtain a search warrant so that the diary could be collected as evidence. But we know that on March 30th, de Villiers actually broke an appointment to meet with Fred in order to meet with Marius instead. Now, I don't think the police ever executed a search warrant. Uh, Marius later found out that the police had photocopies of the diary, and Marius gave the diary to his attorney for safekeeping. Now, this curse story was even leaked to the press, and that is how Marius became a prime suspect. And in the next episode, we will look at what happened in the press, or what appeared in the press, and we will show that this so-called curse is really much ado about nothing. And in the next episode, I will also start looking at the police investigation. I'm pretty sure you're going to learn a lot of things that you've not known before. I'm also going to explore the answer to the question, did the police focus on Fred enough in the days and weeks after the murder? Should they have done more? And in the next episode, I will also show the full crime scene video. I will, of course, edit out the parts that are graphic and not suitable for public viewing. And that's all for today, ladies and gentlemen. If you like this video, please subscribe and give me a thumbs up. I look forward to bringing you episode four. And until then, bye.